this is another episode of This is Revolution Podcast. Special extra long Wednesday edition. This is our, this comes from our Saturday free show. So if you're a listener of the audio only podcast, on Mondays and Fridays and Sundays are our usual about one hour episode and anything over the hour uh, we go to our bonus after hours the after hours segment and we have the after hour segments now for audio only If you have the means and you feel so inclined, become a patron. Get access to all the after hours, sometimes spicy discussions. Definitely off color discussions. Not that we don't curse in the first hour, but we definitely curse in the bonus hour. Patreon.com backslash Bitter Lake presents. So this episode uh, is one that's been a long time coming. Uh, I would say for the past maybe six months, people have been asking us to do an episode on France Fanon. And I didn't know what angle to take when talking about Fanon. Mainly because I feel that before you jump into a discussion about a figure like Fanon that didn't really live that long, I think he died at like 39, but his influence is still very strong, especially when you talk about things like Afro-pessimism, but bigger than that, I, I enjoyed Wretched of the Earth, definitely was it fiery read for me and black skin white masks black mask white skin I always I always say it wrong anyway there was a certain angle Pascal wanted to take on the Fanon discussion and Jean Bajlan had come across a book about Fanon by Dr. Peter Hudis and I, I didn't finish it but I definitely read all the articles I could from from Dr. Hudis. I think Pascal might have finished the book and really really enjoyed it so we wanted to get uh, Dr. Hudis in a lot earlier but you know scheduling but this was a great discussion on not just a deep dive. It's you know, it's a it's a history, so you understand who we we're talking about in France Fanon. Why he's still a very important figure, and then we got in the weeds of asking some questions of Fanon, um, as the idea of post Marxism becomes more and more popular mainly in academic circles but sometimes Fanon kind of sits in a lot of these academic circles especially when you talk about things like Afro-pessimism is he a post-Marxist figure since he had his own issues with Marxism Marxism, excuse me and I think the discussion had, was a good back and forth because we didn't agree on everything But we definitely are going to bring Peter back on. Because I, I felt it was a great, fruitful discussion. If you knew nothing of Fanon, or maybe you had um, a reading without like a study group <laughs> of Wretched of the Earth or, or Black Skin, 
this was a great discussion to help you understand those texts a lot better to help you understand where Fanon is coming from when he's writing these texts a lot better to help you understand the movements of where Fanon's coming from so we, we got into the weeds of the Nicritude movement we got into the weeds of terms like racial capitalism on this one so this was a good show and again this is from the Saturday free shows this is a longer one it's like two hours long so I hope you enjoy it if you want to watch shows like this in real time the best place to do it is probably YouTube youtube.com backslash this is revolution podcast also if you didn't know uh, Pascal and I are featured on the it's not in your head podcast and I was featured on the majority report with Sam Cedar where we go over the piece I published in Medium. I was a teenage anarchist. Please check those two things out. We talk about black trauma on the It's Not In Your Head podcast. And my article is about the culture of deconstruction and authenticity in punk music and how those cultures relate to the online left. So check those out. Don't forget, every Tuesday and Thursday, we stream at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. That music playing means it's time for you to go. Thank you for your time, and I am out. Good morning, everyone. For some of you, good evening for those who watch this today. And welcome to another edition of This is Revolution Podcast. I am your host, Jason Miles. I just want to remind you guys, if you haven't done it already, hit that like button. If you're not subscribed, hit the subscribe button. I was on Majority Report yesterday talking about. Gen X shit. Sam Cedar. It was a good time. Hope you guys tuned in and watched it. Where is Jason, you ask? I am in a hotel, and I am in California. I'm in Monterey, California, with Phoenix, who might make an appearance uh, on the show. So we'll see. So let me bring in my homie, my co-host, my dog, Mr. Pascal Robert. 
peace and greetings to the chat. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings, Jason Miles, live from Monterey, California. Happy Saturday, everyone. And uh, glad to see you there. Here, I should say. Uh, yeah, this was, uh, I did not take the, the large computer. I'm trying something new. Uh, so I'll probably be off air for a lot of this show, <laughs> doing production stuff in the back. And we have to bring this gentleman in. I usually make a joke about him being the only black guy that lived in Maine. But I'm not going to do that today. Marcus of the left flank. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, nonchalant uh, supporter of Terry McAuliffe here. Just, uh, <laughs> that's a big admit that's a big admission there just, buddy whenever whenever they get my uh whenever they get my poll here to my doorstep i might i might fill it out but um i i don't feel like going outside to do it he doesn't really inspire that much so that's a big admission there buddy uh, whoa 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 <laughs> that was just jokes i will hope so yeah <laughs> no um <laughs> Is it uh, Princess Balding? That's uh, that's that's who's got the the governor vote for me. LME says Google says Maine has one point seven percent black people. That was Marcus and his Bay's children. It was one. It's one point five <laughs> now. And let us bring in our guest, Pascal. Would you like to introduce our guest today? Uh, this is a show that you wanted to do. So I'm excited for this one. We have today Professor Hudis, who is a scholar and academic intellectual uh, who has written a book on the subject of uh, Franz Fanon, who will be discussing the significance of Franz Fanon and his legacy with us today on This Is Revolution podcast. So we would like to welcome, please, Professor Hudis. Dr. Peter Hudis. Thank you very much. I would just only add one thing is I'm more of an activist than an academic, frankly. And that's where my interest in Fanon came out of. But uh, sure, I take the, I'll, I'll take the, uh, the title of professor once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've been wanting to do, it's, it's interesting. So we started doing this, well, I started doing this show it's been two years. The anniversary actually passed the two-year anniversary. We didn't even do anything for it, guys. How horrible are we? Um, and the last, I would say, mm, three or four months, I've been getting a lot of uh, people sending me messages saying, you should do a show on Fanon. You should do a show on Fanon. And um, Pascal had wanted to talk to somebody about Fanon from a different perspective. Cause I think the perspective of Fanon that people are getting right now is, is more from the Afro pessimist angle. And uh, when we came across your book, uh, Jean Bajlan, who's a part of the show sent us uh, your book. And we all kind of was like, Oh wow, this is awesome. We're going to get this guy on the show. So we kind of ran as quickly as we could to try to get you on. Um, I wish we could have got you on earlier, but I'm, I'm very happy to have you here now. So this is my way of saying thank you for coming on, first and foremost. And for those that don't know who Franz Fanon is, um, Dr. Hudis, why is Fanon still an influential character somewhat 60 years later, in your opinion? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons. One is that he is the foremost uh, thinker on issues of race and racism uh, from a philosophical as well as a political perspective that um, we're working in the 20th century, or certainly the second half of the 20th century. Um, and he's somebody who combines a political, philosophical, and psychoanalytical approach to the problem of racism. So he's somebody who is neither somebody who is ignoring the socioeconomic, political uh, ramifications of racism, nor is, it some, nor is he somebody who's simply looking at those aspects and not dealing with the inner psychic life of racism. What impact does it have on the human psyche, both in terms of the perpetrators of racism and, of course, most of all, 
the victims of racial discrimination. So he has this remarkable ability, plus on top of that, an amazingly beautiful writer um, who came out of the negritude movement of the 1940s and 50s uh, and has this beautiful poetic expressionist prose about way of expressing himself. So he's a literary figure, he's a political figure, he's a philosophical figure, um, and he's made an important contribution to the field of psychiatry in terms of focusing on the psychodynamics of racism. So he's a very unique sort of character. I think he particularly, however, is important because um, we use today as almost like a phrase, like a cliche, uh, race is, uh, is not a biological construct, but or a phenomenon, but it's a social, con a social construction. And um, we can talk more through this interview about how, how well people understand that concept and what they mean by it, because a lot of people mean different things by it. But there's no question that Fanon, it kind of crossed a conceptual threshold in putting forth exactly this idea that um, arguing against any essentialist concept of race and arguing that race is constructed at a particular moment of European history, the European imaginary, uh, it arises out of specific economic motives, but then it takes a life of its own and um, invades the life world of Western cu culture and society as a whole. Um, and that the only way to rid ourselves of racism is by transforming the fundamental fabric of human relations. Uh, simply uh, uh, doing some piecemeal political reforms or simply trying to aim for self-expression or a, a safe place in which to develop our, our passions and our interests, that's not enough. And Fanon because he had this revolutionary approach rooted in what we call a sociogenic approach to problems of race and racism, he has taken on much greater resonance in the last uh, number of years. And he's being appropriated now, I think, in much more fruitful and healthy manner, more conducive to his own, uh, uh, the motivations of his own philosophical outlook uh, on the part of many people, not all, but on the part of many people, than you might have had when he was kind of boxed into academia in the 1990s and considered kind of this fellow in post-colonial theory, which I think Fanon would feel rather uncomfortable in because his aspiration was to seek a revolutionary transformation of the world. Uh, and I think now that we're seeing the necessity of that as an urgency for the very continuance of civilization, his revolutionary approach uh, to trying to address and resolve the problems of racial discrimination takes on a lot of substance and sustenance. Um, and you'd mentioned the French uh, negritude movement and um, how that influenced uh, Fanon. Um, would you consider that like a proto-black power movement? And um, can you also go into uh, your kind of uh, critiques or Fanon's hesitations or critiques mm -hmm. of that movement? Yeah, I'm not sure you would call it a black power movement as much as a kind of a, the, a variant of the Harlem Renaissance uh, among French-speaking of black intellectuals in the, in the uh, black diaspora. So it emerges in the 1940s under his high school teacher, Amy Césaire, who is, of course, one of the greatest literary voices of the 20th century in his own right, major political and social figure. Uh, and it included a great number of other people, not only uh, the very famous figures, but there's a number of women who are associated with the negative movement who are now getting increased attention. It was a black pride movement, uh, cultural movement, uh, dealing with art and culture, uh, and it's, it's interested in issues of psychology and literary expression. Um, and it had radical tendencies uh, to a certain degree, because don't forget, in the 1940s in the French Caribbean or in West Africa, uh, to proclaim black is beautiful, right, or to, uh, to affirm uh, the dignity of the, of the individual, regardless of their racial characteristics, was itself a revolutionary step. That was certainly something that was out of the norm. Um, but, um, and Fanon was influenced by negritude. I would have to say he was most influenced by their style of, their style of writing, and especially Amy Césaire's writing, which it is, has its own fluidity and beauty about it. And he certainly thought it was a necessary step in reclaiming pride on the part of those who are discriminated against because of their, uh, their skin color. And uh, so he sees it, at least certainly initially, initially as an important way to battle the inferiority complex. Now, the inferiority complex is something all oppressed people experience in one way or another. In other words, you, every human being, uh, Fernon argues, strives for some type of recognition from the other. You want the dignity of your humanity to be acknowledged by other people. I mean, you see this in children from the youngest age. You see this in people throughout their lives as striving for some sort of recognition and acknowledgement of who they are as, as humans, as individuals. 
And of course, racism blocks that recognition because the racist sees the person of color not as a person, but as an embodiment of an abstract category or as a thing, okay? Uh, so um, inferiority complex comes in at that moment. You want recognition from the other, and yet you're blocked recognition from the master class. So then it's, it's a natural first reaction to say, ah, it's my fault. If I, was only, if I was only less black, if I was only less Jewish, if I was only less queer, if I was only less this or that, then I'll be accepted by the mainstream society. Because who wants to live it completely as an outsider to the mainstream, initially at least? Um, and negritude was at voicing that sort of uh, black pride in reaction against the tendency towards an inferiority complex, which has a lot to do with his first book. After all, it's entitled, it wasn't his title, by the way, but the publisher gave it the title, Black Skin, but White Mask, yes. which is yeah. about that. But for no, even a black skin, white mask is drawing criticisms of negritude because uh, there is a phenomenon that's, uh, that I think he, whether he got it from Hegel or not, I don't know, but it resonates with a concept in Hegel called spirit and self-estrangement. Uh, in his phenomenology, Hegel, philosopher, German philosopher in the early 1800s, mm -hmm. had this really brilliant discussion of how you can oppose something. He's critiquing the Enlight European Enlightenment in this regard. You can oppose something, oppose something like irrationalism, like the Enlightenment did. But if you accept the terms by which your opponent frames issues, then actually in opposing your opponent, you reconstruct the very terms of reference of that opponent, and therefore you lose to their argument. And one thing that Fanon sees in terms of this is negritude wants to capture black pride, but it falls into a kind of essentialism. It wants to assume that there's a unified entity called the black subject, regardless of class distinctions, regardless of national differences, regardless of historical uh, differentiation, etc. Um, and there's a particular phrase that Senghor, Leopold Senghor, who later becomes, of course, the first president of independent Senegal, was an important figure in the negritude movement and a significant poet in his own right, um, made in uh, one of his works where he uh, uses the phrase, uh, uh, emotion is as Negro as reason is Greek. Agreed. So, yeah. <laughs> re rejecting Western rationalism in the name of a kind of black essentialism that, well, we can dance, they can't. OK, mm -hmm. um, well, Fanon is very he quotes that and he's ambivalent <laughs> about it. Right. On the one hand, he sees where he's coming from in black skin, white mass. On the other hand, he's uh, well, wait a second. What is this? Is this just the opposite sides of the same coin? Are we, are we buying into the stereotype and then in a way that's uh, uh, even though we're trying to use it against the oppressor in a way that implicates us in the ideology of the oppressor? And so um, what? Uh, I'm not, not sure if Fanon knew this or not, but that phrase is actually paraphrased from Gobineau, who was one of the arch theorists of European racism. Um, George Lukács has a chapter in one of his books, The Destruction of Reason, written in 1947, where he actually has a discussion of Gobineau's very comment uh, that Senghor probably unwittingly picked it up, didn't realize where he was getting it from. So um, that is kind of the things that made uh, Fanon, even from early on, uh, troubled to some degree about where negritude is going. But once he gets to Africa, and once he joins the revolutionary movement for Algerian and African independence in 1953, in 54, um, Fanon becomes very critical of negritude because he says, okay, you're still discussing all these cultural issues and, you know, uh, a, a, a black essential unity, etc. Where are you on the barricades, right? In other words, now Senghor is leading the independence struggle in Senegal, but Senghor is now compromising with French imperialism. He's willing to be part of the French community, right, which is kind of neo-colonial enterprise established as African countries are becoming politically independent. And even Amy Césaire, who he admired immensely, uh, and was a communist, by the way, a um, member of the Communist Party for many, and many that, years, and opposes that, and that, independence uh, for Martinique, his homeland. So Fanon begins to see that Renegritude does not have the kind of revolutionary content that was necessary. And by the time we get to, let's say, 1958, 1959, various conferences that he speaks at, he actually shocks the negritude delegates by getting but followers of negritude are at the conference. He gets yeah. up and he says, you know, you guys ain't doing anything for the re revolutionary struggle in terms of uh, where do you stand on the question of violence? Where do you stand on the question of extending the revolution beyond the stage of bourgeois democratic uh, leadership? Uh, and when they cannot respond to those sort of um, politicized radical demands that he's putting forth, uh, he bids his adieu to negritude. Now, now, uh, Peter, 
you also write that uh, in this in this time for Fanon, a lot of communists were okay with some of the imperialism that was going on in in Africa, and and that was a reason why Fanon kind of pushed back against the idea of Marxism. Well, that's part of the reason. Um, the Communist Party of France, uh, despite its so-called Leninist origins, uh, or Lenin's inclinations in terms of Lenin himself, of course, fiercely opposed colonialism and denounced it. And, is very famous for having uh, added three words, you can say, to the Communist Manifesto. Marx said, workers of the world unite. Lenin added three little words, and colonized peoples, right? <laughs> and that's what made him famous in the developing world for many, many decades, okay? Uh, but despite that background, uh, the, by the 1940s, uh, the French Communist Party, becoming thoroughly Stalinist, uh, was hostile to independent movements in Africa. People forget that the Soviet Union did not support African liberation movements until much later. Um, Stalin attacked Nkrumah as a stooge of British imperialism in the 1950s, right? Uh, so did other Soviet leaders. They switched when they began to realize that, well, in the struggle for the Cold War, we should win these newly African states, uh, new, newly independent African states over to our side. And that's when they got more interested in Africa. So the French Communist Party, following the Moscow line, aside from the fact that uh, they imbibed an awful lot of racist and colonialist assumptions, which much of the labor movement did, it, certainly the Socialist Party was no better than the Communist Party. Uh, the Socialist Party actually directly it was part of the government at one point and actually directly uh, participated in the suppression of the Algerian Revolution. So um, Stalinism and, the, and, and these tendencies that dominated Marxism, unfortunately, from the 19, late 1920s onward, um, there were periods and there were, there were uh, Communist parties in certain parts of the world which did important anti-racist work. We can talk about the U.S. Communist Party in this regard. But it always followed the lines of Moscow's foreign policy. So even like the American Communist Party did very, very important work, let's say from the mid-20s to the late 30s, especially uh, in fighting racism. But when the Popular Front came in in 1937, the idea that, well, communists have to unite with bourgeois liberals and whoever else in order to fight fascism, uh, then the black struggle was put on the back burner. And as many of you know, um, in 1943, when the Harlem riots breaks out, the Communist Party denounces it and actually supports the Smith Act at first that prosecuted those who independent Marxists who were, were, were solidarizing with those sort of, of struggles of the black masses. And then the Smith Act was then later used against the communists. So the point here is, is that, yes, Fanon is living through all of this. And he's quite disgusted with the French communists and socialists. Um, now, there are other Marxists and Marxist tendencies in France. We know for a fact that he was... In, when he went to Lyon, he was attending meetings of uh, Trotskyist organizations. Uh, my own mentor, Rai Dunievsky, a, a founder of Marxist humanism, were herself, was herself at the time a Trotskyist and was in Lyon in the 1940s. And she was convinced that Fanon was sitting in the audience when she was giving a speech one time. And um, we have other evidence that he was associating with various figures who were in the left of the communist and socialist parties. But even those tendencies had not worked out a theory of racialization. They did not have a developed politics of how to combat racism. I wouldn't say they were class reductionists, all of them, but they had a strong tendency in that direction. And that was not something that Fanon, uh, that didn't speak to his lived experience. So Fanon never called himself a Marxist. That doesn't mean that he wasn't deeply influenced by Marxist currents, and especially by Marx, which he read, we know he read the, especially the early Marx, the 1844 manuscripts, pretty early in life when he was like 21, 22 years old. And it no doubt made a lasting impression on, on him. After all, originally the title of Black Skin, White Masks is a theory on the disalienation of the black man. Well, alienation, of course, central to the 1844 manuscripts. So, um, it, so that it, but at the same time, I think um, uh, we shouldn't um, uh, assume that uh, Fanon was completely outside the Marxist tradition as well, because as we'll get to talk about, a lot of things that he develops in his later work, especially the Wretched of the Earth, is directly confronting one of the central debates within Marxist theory. And that is, how do you make a revolution in a technologically underdeveloped society and not fall victim to the powers of either, of either uh, imperialism, colonialism, or, or a bourgeois nationalist stage of development in which um, a fundamental social transformation doesn't actually uh, ensue. And Fanon is drawing from a lot of debates within the Marxist movement and staking out his own position on this in The Wretched of the Earth. He doesn't always tell you that, but he has no reason to tell you that because he's working it out in his own, in his own terms, in terms of his own vocabulary. Uh, 
America. There's no question that there's a whole background uh, of debates within Marxist theory that he was immersed in, and there were Marxist tendencies within the FLN that he was active in, that he certainly was engaged in a, in a, in a continuous discussion with. Professor Hudis, I really want to thank you for this expository you're sharing with us on, on Fanon, which for me as a, uh, as a child of the French Caribbean, my parents are from Haiti, and mm-hmm. uh, I'm also familiar with the, the influence the Haitian Revolution had on Fanon mm-hmm. and have been reading Fanon since my teenage years. I mean, this first book that I read was Black Skin, uh, uh, and White Mask, and uh, Wretched of the Earth is something I studied in, in college as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of ground I'd like to cover with you in terms of Fanon here, but one of the things that we'd like to discuss uh, is you explaining Fanon's concept on his new humanism mm-hmm. and his uh, developing a kind of uh, way to transcend race and racism by developing a new version of humanism. Can you elaborate for us in terms of what the influences were on that and what he meant by that conception? Mm-hmm. Right. Um, great question. Um, well, by a new humanism, first of all, it's distinguished from an old humanism. So what's the old humanism? <laughs> the old humanism is uh, the humanism, you can say, of the Renaissance and European Enlightenment, which, as um, the known states famously in the Wretch of the Earth, Europe, which knows how to talk about man so well, massacres man wherever he can find him. So humanism in a certain, in a certain veneer, in a certain vocabulary, that is in the part of mainstream European thought, and we have to understand, by the way, neither the Enlightenment nor the Renaissance nor rationalism was, the, was ever the mainstream tendency in European thought. I mean, this is a point which I hopefully will make in my next book more effectively than I have in the past. Irrationalism and anti-rationalism is the, le- is the most important and unfortunately the most important legacy of Western civilization. Uh, we should not by any means assume that the West owns rationalism and the East does not, because <laughs> that's absurd. But in any case, the point is, is that there is a certain strain within Western thought that it advances a kind of humanism, which is abstract and which uh, actually could be counterproductive in the sense of defining the human uh, in a certain way that conforms to that which is white, conforms to that which uh, corresponds to a kind of imperialistic organization of society, etc. And anyone who stands outside of that definition of the so-called human becomes inhuman and therefore you can kill them much more easily, right? Fanon was certainly aware that that type of humanism was uh, something that uh, he viciously <laughs> didn't like, <laughs> viciously opposed and certainly didn't like. So what's the new humanism? Well, Marx himself calls himself a new humanist, and uh, calls himself a humanist, doesn't use the word new humanism, but he calls himself a thoroughgoing humanist in his early writings on alienation in 1844, which, as I mentioned, is no question that Fanon read, studied, and knew of. Um, and what did Marx mean by that? Well, Marx meant that, well, what's the target of an anti-capitalist revolution? Most Marxists would try to tell you, well, it's the existence of private property, the free market, uh, um, class inequality, etc. But uh, you can make an argument, as I do in my book on Marx, that uh, actually Marx's critique of capital goes much deeper than that, although he opposes all those things. He opposes them because they're expressions of alienated, dehumanized human relationships. So unless you transform the very fabric of human relationships at the base, in terms of the conditions and relations of everyday life, beginning with the point of production, the workplace, but not ending there by any means, unless you transform alienated human relationships, you don't end up with a truly new society. You can replace private property by nationalized property, a free market with a planned economy, but you haven't ended class oppression. Well, for Fanon, who's well aware of this, neither does it even touch the question of racial discrimination. You can have a welfare state, and I'm all for one, uh, as at least the, uh, against those who are trying to destroy it. But let's be frank, uh, having a more expansive welfare state is not going to uproot the deep-rooted uh, ways, race, racialized and racist ways of seeing that define modernity. Uh, much more fundamental uprooting is needed. So mm-hmm. what kind of uprooting is needed? Well, you certainly have to change the social, political, economic structures of existing society. But Fanon is interested in the test or the measure of to extent to which they can transform has to do with how, one, uh, we, the way we, way we see each other is transformed. The assumptions we have when we gaze upon the other is radically altered and transformed. Because all of us, certainly, and certainly white Americans more than most others in the world, are simply schooled from a very, very early age to view those people of color uh, in a dehumanizing way. 
or certainly in a stereotypically a pre, uh, uh, stereotypical way. So if that is not changed, if that is not altered, and that doesn't automatically happen from, let's say, a change in political or economic structures, uh, then the problem of racism persists. And the practice of racism, that all kinds of discriminatory practices and privileges that are given to those who, who impose racial discrimination, all of those sort of things have to be addressed. So for Fanon, the fundamental problem of racism is that it depersonalizes the individual, okay? And I think the task that he had throughout his life was to, trans is to oppose this depersonalization and restore the personalization of the individual. That is, restore the personal dignity and the capacity for fulfillment and for the expression of the fullness of one's human capacities, um, which racism suppresses. And so unless there's a transformation of, of human relations, not simply political economic structures uh, on an interpersonal relation uh, level, um, you're not going to get to a new society. Just parenthetically, just to end here, because I don't want to speak too long on, on any one point, on one question. But I mean, one thing that strikes me in, in terms of the expression of this new humanism, it's a very famous story when Fanon is working as a psychiatrist in Algeria during this horrible, violent war where the French killed at least half a million Algerians fighting for independence, gets a knock on his door, so to speak, one day. And who is there but a white paramilitary officer, somebody working for the French military, asked to be led into the clinic to be treated. Fanon interviews him, brings him into his office and says, OK, what are you doing here? What's up? And to make a long story short, this French officer basically says, well, I'm having a lot of problems. I can't sleep at night. I'm unable to have sexual relations with my wife. I don't know why. Uh, I'm having nightmares. I'm really falling apart. Maybe you can help. I heard you're a good psychiatrist. I I'm looking for help. And so Fanon actually has a discussion of this in one of his works, uh, of his discussion with this guy. Uh, and what he asks him is that, well, what are you doing with the French military? And he says, well, I, I torture people professionally. That's, this is what he does eight hours a day. So Fanon talks about the dehumanization of this individual's self-inflicted dehumanization, right, by working for the French military authorities. But he doesn't dismiss him and say, hey, get out of my office, right? He, 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 so it's not on the grounds of liberal humanitarianism, right? Not that old-fashioned type of humanism. He wants to, he wants to understand how racism affects the psychic structure of the oppressor as well as the oppressed. Um, and um, treats the guy, okay, puts him under therapy. Now, it's not simply because that's professionally he was obligated to do, but Fanon had a notion that we have to, it is possible to transform the dehumanized state of human personality, the corroded state of human personality, that capitalism and racism and sexism and homophobia and all these other phenomena impose upon us. It is possible to change that. And if you can't change that, if you don't have that faith that it can be changed, then it becomes very problematic what kind of actual new society one's going to create as a result. It's interesting that you bring that up because uh, on some some other shows, uh, this conversation has been happening about, uh, is it possible to de-radicalize these, these hate mongers, if you will? And I, this is definitely anecdotal, but yesterday before I went on, on air, I, I live uh, by the beach so I went to go walk down to the beach and, and reread this thing I wrote that I was going to be interviewed about. And as, I, as I'm doing it, uh, an older Asian man uh, walked up to me and just started talking to me out of the blue, which happens in a beach town, right? People are just happy to be in front of the ocean. And uh, as he's talking to me, he tells me that he's from Cambodia. So the first thing I say is, oh, did you leave during Pol Pot? He goes, yeah, but I liked it there. <laughs> I said, Really? Uh, he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was in the Khmer Rouge as a, as a child. He goes, they treated us great. I didn't want to leave. And had a 20, 30 minute conversation or so uh, with this man that uh, was a, what we would call a child soldier, but he definitely denounced the whole child soldier thing. He says, look, man, they gave us the M16s, but we couldn't shoot him. We were too small. He goes, I was like 10. Right. But 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 it was a, it was an interesting conversation because as he comes to America, he tells me about encountering racism because the first place he came that gave asylum to his people was Georgia in the 70s. 
And I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> so it, it, it was an interesting take. But uh, in that, that conversation about can you de-radicalize people as you talk about the new society, um, there becomes this conversation of do you punch a Nazi or do you try to de-radicalize a Nazi? Can you de-radicalize a Nazi? And I think it can happen, but it's definitely a long, laborious process. And, you know, it's kind of like getting people off drugs. You don't just uh, walk up to somebody and say, do you need help? And then, then they get it. You know, it is definitely a process. And, and certainly that was not Fanon's approach, of course, and not, nor would I endorse it. When it comes to a Nazi, uh, uh, you, you, you defeat them. You don't treat them. Uh, a, a revolutionary, it's, it's a contest of wills. And you're not going to convince somebody to change their mind of, of, of something if they are excluded, if they exclude themselves from rational discourse, which is what a racist does, okay? So uh, an enemy like that ultimately simply has to be uh, either silenced or defeated in one way or another. And this is why Fanon was a firm advocate of revolutionary violence within the African context. He didn't make a universal of violence as some people claim that he did, but he certainly didn't think he was going to win the, um, uh, many of the, the French colons over to, um, over to the course of... Uh, of a, of a liberated Algeria, although he left the door open for that. That's something that people should keep in mind. He didn't want the French settlers to leave Algeria at the end of liberation, right? He argued mm -hmm. within the FLN, where there was a lot of debates about this, that stipulations and conditions should be made that would make it possible for them to stay. But he wasn't anxious to keep them there if they weren't going to accept the new reality that they have to surrender their white privileges, right? So mm -hmm. now I wouldn't want to generalize from the story that I told to suggest that either Fanon or myself is thinking that you can negotiate with Nazis or racists. But mm -hmm. uh, there is a possibility among some, as we know, who are willing to enter into a rational discourse, right, and willing to rethink uh, where they're coming from, that they could change. But Fanon's concern, of course, was not with that. His primary, primary concern, rightly so, was lifting up the dignity of those discriminated by racial violence and, and, uh, and oppression. And rightly so, because just like Marx was not... Uh, was a when he walked through the word humanism, he didn't mean humanitarianism. He didn't mean you know um, all all men are brothers. That's not a slogan that Marx and Engels endorsed. They workers of the world unite. Uh, the bourgeoisie is not your friend, and you're not going to try to win them over. But of course, even in the Communist Manifesto, Marx says in a revolutionary situation, a section of the ruling class will come over to the side of the revolutionaries, and we've seen evidence of that throughout yeah. history. And in fact, Marx himself is an example of that. He comes from a very bourgeois background, and yet he joined the barricade, so to speak. Um, so um, the point is, is that um, is the humanism has to do with it, the, what makes the new, humanism new is that it's a hum, humanism from the point of view or from the point of the perspective of the oppressed. It's not a humanism that's from the top down that says, hey, everybody, let's just pretend that we live in a better world than it appears to be. Uh, on the contrary, it's a new humanism that's forged uh, through a, a, a trail of tears, right? Through a, a battle, through a process of what Hegel calls negativity, what Marx calls the class struggle. And for, for known, it's a Manichaean struggle, right? Against uh, the forces of reaction. So in the United States today, we're not going to win over the Republican right. The Republican right has won itself over to Donald Trump. First time in American history, we've had a major political party in America that's won over basically to neo-fascism. And that's precisely because they turned away from reason. They turned away from any pursuit of the truth. Tens of millions of people don't care about that. What they simply care about is protecting whatever privileges they perceive themselves to have. Those sort of people, I mean, you're not going to win them over. Thank you for that. <laughs> that, was, that was actually a, a great explanation. Uh, Professor Hudis, I want to actually pivot a little bit back to negritude because in your um, explanation of uh, Fanon's evolution, on the question of negritude, it act, one of the re things I read from Fanon, I didn't I, I didn't initially get it from him, but one of the things I, I I understand from him and his critique of negritude is something that I've written about that I've actually find is a consistent element of early aspects of black political thought that is premised on the concept. Even if you read early writings from the the writers the uh, proponents of the Haitian Revolution. The concept of racial vindicationism, the need to vindicate black identity to prove its valor or validity to to the quote unquote you know white class or the master class or the or to 
to uh, to uh, to the West in mm-hmm. order to basically have one's humanity uh, uh, respected by this kind of quote unquote oppressive oppressive class. Mm-hmm. Uh, my position has always been that one of the the word in the word in French is piège, or one of the holes, or one of the 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 fault lines of much of black thought, which is a logical position when you are reacting to such an oppressive, degraded state, is that the notion of racial vindicationism or what I call the politics of redemption becomes such an obsessive point of reference in terms of stating the first actual foundations of your position relative to the forces of oppression is that you concede that the forces of you of oppression have the right to determine your humanity in mm-hmm. the first place. And what I find interesting about Fanon is that may, even though he may not have said that explicitly, his writings demonstrate that he was aware that this is what nigritude had basically fallen into. And his, his uh, rejection of all things French reminds me very much of uh, the Haitian founding father Jean-Jacques Dessalines, in that it was a very Dessalines thing. It's like we have to reject these people completely, uh, because, as you know, I'm sure you've read Fanon's writing in French. Is that mm-hmm. French, contrary to what p- many people in the Anglo-American world realize, there's a certain kind of toxicity to French racism that is so absolutely vile. I think mm-hmm. that as someone who comes from a former French colony can understand why the, the immediate reaction would say, we have to reject these French people completely. So mm-hmm. I'd like you, if you can really talk about Fanon's awakening to that re- politics of redemption or vindicationist posture that plagues so much of Black thought, I'd really like to hear your thoughts on his perceptions of that or how he would or did kind of react to that in his writing politically. Yeah, very interesting. I agree with you with the thrust of every of what of, of your comments here. Um, see, the irony is is that negritude emerges as a movement to combat the inferiority complex that uh, one is subjected to in the colonial context, right? But I think his view is that uh, negritude ultimately falls victim to the very inferiority complex that it's protesting. Uh, and so far as why, why, if if you if you emphasize this question of vindication, right? Uh, I wish to be vindicated in, in for uh, in terms of my subjectivity. Okay, okay. Of course, that has a that there's a there's there's a positive motive in that. Behind that, undoubtedly, lurks the notion that I want to be acknowledged for who I am, not for how I seem or for how I for how I'm treated. Right. There's something fundamentally inhuman about the way I'm being seen and being treated, and I want that reversed. But you see, that can go in a lot of different directions. One direction could be by trying to become more white, okay? In other words, uh, and there's a lot of expressions of that. Trying to become more white doesn't literally mean whitening your skin. Trying to become more white could sim- can also take the expression of, um, you know, wanting to simply get people to acknowledge you for your blackness, uh, without suggesting any sort of revolutionary transformation to make that occur, okay? You want to fit into the established norm of things, within the established framework of things, but at the same time be acknowledged for who you are. Well, this is inherently contradictory. You're not going to be acknowledged as a person in a capitalist society. Uh, it just doesn't happen. And capital views people as things, not as... That's the whole purpose of what capital is about. You accumulate capital by treating of the individual, not as a personification of economic categories, not as an actual person themselves. But there's another direction that this can go, this, this politics of vindication. And certainly uh, you, can get, you can fall into a black essentialism or a kind of black nationalism, right? Which says that, oh, because uh, this is who I am as part of this racialized group, okay? Um, oh, I can find a home in that, okay? And make, and make find comes kind of, peace or resolution, an island of safety, of spirit, in my self-expression of my, so to speak, blackness. There is also positive elements of that. We shouldn't rush too fast to criticize that, because that could have certain very revolutionary implications as well, potentially. But it also has other implications that are not so, that are not so revolutionary, because it comes back to Fanon's notion of 
sociogenesis. That is, that race is a social construction. Now, that means it's an imaginary notion. It's a completely imaginary notion, but it has very real political, social, everyday consequences, right? So when you try to capture a space for blackness that's independent of, 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 of taking apart uh, the society that gives this these false biological attributes to such terms as blackness and whiteness, uh, you're still operating within this framework. I mean, this is why I get rather annoyed, frankly, um, when I hear people, you know, you get into kind of sometimes you get in these arguments at philosophy conferences, or sometimes it shows up in my classroom. Uh, a student once asked me, for instance, not long ago, was Plato white, right? Because uh, he heard about, you know, uh, probably heard about Burnell's thesis about black Athenia. Uh, was Plato actually white or was Plato black? Uh, and um, he was asking that, you know, because he wanted to know, hey, if he's black, maybe I'll read him. <laughs> uh, I'm trying to read all these white folks, right? Um, why do you have to keep reading Descartes and these kind of guys? And, you know, I'm sympathetic with that view. But I said, well, wait a second, hold on. We're reading Fanon in this class at the same time. And so I'm saying, what's the logical conclusion of sociogenesis? It, the logical conclusion of sociogenesis is that Plato was not white and that nobody at that time was white, nor was anybody black. OK, Th those are just terms of color differentiation, epidermal differentiations of color. But there was no social structures built upon those differences. Right. This is something that comes in with the transatlantic slave trade, you know, in the, in the 15th century, the beginning of the 15th, but really the 16th century. This categorization that, oh, skin color now denotes this particularity called race. There's not even a word race in any European language prior to the 1460s, from what I can tell. And the word race, la raza, in Spanish was originally used to refer to Jews who were first identified as a separate race in, during the period of the Spanish Inquisition in the 15th century. So these are all socially constructed notions, but we're so used to it seeping into us and defining our thought that even when we say we're against uh, biological racial thinking and racialized constructions, as you fall into it. And as I mentioned, Negritude fell into it, and Fanon saw that. So a lot of the politics of vindication that you're referring to, I think sometimes resonates with that sort of failure to be consistently uh, following through on the ramifications of what I consider a real paradigm shift that Fanon introduces, the concept of sociogenesis. He takes that, that condition, very, that, that concept very, very seriously. This is why he says, the problem is not that uh, whites, white Europeans came and you know, colonized the world. Uh, the problem is that is that white Europeans who are part of a capitalist economy came and, cap, ca, uh, and, and colonized the world, and that process carried with it, endemic to it, the birth of racialized ways of seeing and treating other people. Those are two different things. So when we talk about whiteness, we also have to be careful how we use that term. Some people use it as if, oh, wow, there, there was a you know, social construction of whiteness occurred, you know, in the Middle Ages or something, or in ancient, or even in ancient Greece or something, which doesn't seem to make any sense if it's the case, which I think all the evidence suggests that this, these, these very categories are born much more recently, uh, and we just tend to read them back into history and back into all sorts of other areas of our lives without realizing the ramifications of accepting this paradigm shift that Fanon introduced in ways of thinking about race and racism. One of the things I definitely want to do is give credit to your book, if we didn't mention the title, France Fanon, Philosopher of the Barricades, Revolutionary Lives. So people, please go out and get the book as well. We'll definitely promote the link. But one of the things that I also wanted to uh, for you to touch on, because there's so much uh, in terms of the, the, the comprehensive nature of Fanon's work, is that one of the things that I think he was very prescient in this regard, which many uh, contemporary uh, Pan-Africanist revolutionaries also wrote about as well, the, uh, Kwame Nkrumah to discuss as well, is that his position on the neo-colonial bourgeoisie and the statements he made basically about the fact that, you know, we have these, and some would call them petite bourgeoisie because they really don't even own means of production. We have this professional managerial class of black people, mm -hmm. black and brown, some Arab people who exist in these former colonies who have the educational capacity and the Western skill sets to become leaders of our societies. And what Fanon realizes at this early point in the revolution 
and the development of these nation states is that there is going to be a strong propensity and possibility that these people will basically align with former colonial powers or other powers and not be true to the actually the actual revolutionary uh, motivations of our movement and you know play a role in which they are agents of the colonizer mm -hmm. and as we can see in myriad examples throughout the uh, the black diaspora that's exactly what happens i would also argue that's pretty much exactly what happens in the case of the haitian revolution as well mm -hmm. is that these movements are betrayed by an internal some people would use comprador class or neo-colonial bourgeoisie if you will that reify the same mechanisms of oppression that were placed on them by the colonizer. In, in saying that, and in recognizing that, how, how exactly does Fanon address maintaining the internal integrity of the revolution at the same time recognizing that this factor is almost <laughs> unable to be avoided. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, right, so we have this phenomenon in which uh, a group of people, which you expect, who want to oppose and do oppose their degradation, uh, the way they're degraded by conditions of colonial domination, whether it be in the United States or whether it be anywhere else in the world, uh, in an actual colony or in what you might call a post-colony, post-colonial situation in the United States. And they come from a certain social strata that they definitely want to um, free themselves from this sort of degradation of themselves because of, their, because of the way society racializes and presses them the basis of their racialization. But at the same time, want to achieve this sort of self-expression or liberation, if you want to call it that, without questioning the fundamental uh, context of the society they're living in. Uh, now, that can happen to anybody, regardless of what class you're from. But this, the kind of attitude permeates what you're basically describing as the petty bourgeoisie, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and in a colonial context, this becomes especially dangerous because the colonial pe petty bourgeoisie gains real material privileges, by uh, expressing itself, let's say, within a racialized uh, framework, at the same time as accepting the parameters of the given structures of neocolonialism. They get contracts, they get foreign aid, they get military aid. They are able to exploit their own masses in a way that enables them to become much wealthier than, uh, than the workers or the peasants or others within the society. So it's an almost an inevitable development that both sides of this is going to happen that regardless of class origin, there's always going to be a section of people, just like there's a section of the working class that will fight uh, capitalism, but only in the sense of, oh, give me a better wages and, and benefits within the structure of the system, and then I'll be okay, right? Uh, there's nothing inherent in fighting um, against cap the injustices of the wage labor system that brings you to say, well, no, we have to have the entire structure of capitalism be uprooted, uh, merely getting better wages and benefits while I want that and I'm going to fight for it is not where I'm going to settle the score, right? I'm not going to settle my fight there. Same thing happens, a kind of a parallel phenomenon in the struggle against race and racism. Now, Fanon was aware that this was an inevitable problem in the African context, and it has a particular uh, ring in the African, and also to a large degree, the Caribbean context, of course, because you don't have the same historical development as in Europe. The petty bourgeoisie in Europe um, has a... Um, even with all that you can say against it, in certain contexts has a productive role, okay? Uh, and there's even places in Marx's work where he says, no, the petty bourgeoisie at certain historical junctures could even possibly play a revolutionary role. But Fanon sees that it's a parasitic class in the colonial context. You don't have the economic structures that you have in Europe. You don't have the kind of productive resources. So, and, and you're talking about extractive economies, right? where still after independence, you have this neocolonial model, which still, of course, prevails. I mean, if you take a look at Latin America, even countries as prosperous as Chile, the amount of extraction of ore being taken out of the country, being sent to China, for instance, the value of that, it's astronomical, right? They're still primary producers to a large degree, being sucked dry by neocolonialism. Um, well, 
in that kind of a situation, this petty bourgeois strata that wants to find its way and make peace with the system at the same time as presenting a posture of, oh, I wish to be vindicated for my racial oppression and, and take pride in my, in my racial identity, uh, well, that becomes even counterproductive to their very existence. So how does Fanon get around that? How does Fanon say we get around that? Because it's bound to be there. In fact, it's an objective, uh, it, it's something that exists objectively. Well, in the African context, he says, but precisely because the productive base is so weak, precisely because we're talking about extractive economies without a truly large productive base of the economy, um, the petty bourgeoisie doesn't have as much strength as it might have in certain European contexts. What does have strength is that the majority of the population is outside of all of this, right? The majority of the population in the time that he's writing, certainly, are peasants. So this is one of the reasons why Fanon singled out the peasantry as the revolution, primary revolutionary force in Africa. It's an exaggeration and a caricature to say he completely dismisses the working class. That's not true. And sometimes he may have gone too far with his uh, positive evaluation of the peasantry. But in the main, he was correct, I think, because he recognized that if the revolution is going to go beyond the bourgeois democratic stage, which is what he wanted to happen upon independence, he didn't, wasn't fighting just for national independence. He was fighting for new humanism. And what does a new humanism mean? A new humanism means transforming the fundamental basis of existing society, right? Uprooting it root and branch. Well, uh, what force can you rely on to do that? Well, you certainly can't rely on this petty bourgeois strata we're talking about. You, cert you can't rely strictly on the working class in the societies where industrial working class might represent three or four percent of the population, if that. So what do you rely on? Well, he says, you've got to ground the revolution in the masses, by which he means the peasant masses. And this is what the approach that he was taking in The Wretched of the Earth. Uh, now, retrospectively, many people, especially Marxists, get me very annoyed sometimes. I'm a Marxist humanist myself, but uh, because for that reason, I'm very annoyed at a lot of Marxists, uh, create these kind of arguments that, oh, well, um, you can't get there with the peasantry. It's got to be through the working class, qua working class. But, if you're, but you cannot make a, revol a successful transformation of society, and Fanon understood this, without the revolutionaries having the support of the majority of the oppressed. And if the majority of the oppressed are peasants, right, uh, you better have their support. And if you don't, you better ground yourselves in them and find a way to get their support. Would, would you say this a post-Marxist view, though, to be kind of always questioning the working class slash peasantry? No, because that's exactly what Marx does which is a, a page of Marx's life that unfortunately is, which I've written quite a bit about, by the way, before my Fanon book and now after as well. Just touched upon my Fanon book. But unfortunately, most people skip over. At the end of his life, Marx gets this really interesting letter from an 18-year-old, a 19-year-old, Vera Sasulich, right? It's like, eight, it's like the 1880, 1881. It's like the last two years before he dies. And she says, you know, I, uh, dear Marx, I, I, I've now become, a, I was a populist, now I'm you know, supporting the peasants, now I'm a Marxist. You know, my, my leader is this guy, Klikhanov. But I've been asking them questions, and they haven't been able to give me an answer to the question to my satisfaction. Uh, they tell me that Russia has to go through, because Russia was still a developing society at the time. You can say Russia was, you know, part of the global south in a way. Czar's <laughs> Russia, Russia, right? Yeah. Right. Czar's like Russia. Very in society, yeah. Yeah. So uh, she says, they're all telling me, the Marxists here in Russia, that Russia's got to go through an extended period of capitalistic development because we have a tiny working class and 90% of the population is peasant. And only when you have full-fledged capitalism for many decades in which the peasantry is converted into proletarians, mm -hmm. only then can you open the ways to fight for socialism and put socialism on the agenda. Mm -hmm. And she says, they tell me that this is your position, but I don't know. I read Capital. I'm not sure that's not what you say. Is that what you really mean? Mm -hmm. And Marx writes back and she says, well, there's no nothing in my book Capital that will answer that question one way or the other. <laughs> because it's, it's it, the historical discussion of the accumulation of capital in my great book Mm -hmm. is restricted to just saying what happened in West Europe. But I'm not claiming that, that the rest of the world is going to follow that process. So he says, as a matter of fact, though, for the last 10 years, I've been studying Russia and other countries. He learned Russian when he was in his 60s to try to figure out what was going on there. Interesting. And he says, from what I can see, the peasants are the revolutionary force because there's these peasant communal institutions in the countryside, the rural commune, that are kind of almost proto-communistic in the way the peasants organize their daily lives. And he says, well, this could be a basis of a Russian communism that could be built without having to go through the destructive decades of capitalistic industrialization, so long as a couple of conditions were met. That is, that these communes maintain themselves and weren't destroyed by one or another factor, 
And if once the peasants made this kind of social revolution uh, to get rid of uh, you know, the czarist regime uh, and tried to build this more like indigenous Russian socialism based on the communal forms of the rural countryside, if they get support from the workers of the industrialized West, because they need technology and everything else, they could actually get to communism before the West Europeans. And this is called Marx, right? Mm -hmm. Now, is that a post-Marxist position? It is a post-Marxist position if you accept Volga Marxism as Marxism. But the problem is, is that that's the problem. We have all been raised on vulgarized conceptions of Marxism, whether we're for it or against it. We, it's a vulgar Marxism, that 20th century Marxism. So, I mean, there are great 20th century Marxists, don't get me wrong. But the predominant tendency has been a very vulgarized, unilinear, stages type of Marxism, which uh, by no accident has had a lot of trouble dealing with race. I mean, you have Marxist theories on all sorts of issues, you even have Marxist theories of culture and of art and of aesthetics and of political structures, etc. Where is the Marxist theory of racialization? Hmm? Who's done it? Uh, that's a gap. And the, the gap is there because of a kind of um, approach that uh, I think uh, was more of a stereotype of what Marx was really trying to get at. Marx was a much more expansive thinker than a lot of people recognize. So I think in that sense, Fanon didn't know any of this. He didn't know these late writings of Marx. Um, but he was doing, as far as I can see, he was doing in Africa, trying to think through the problem in Africa in the same kind of terms that Marx was. He mm -hmm. wasn't thinking about some metaphysical theory that explains how all societies have to forever uh, develop. This is not what Marx was doing either. He's protests at the end of his life. A review of his book, Capital, appears in Russian. And the guy credits Marx with developing a universal theory that predicts how all societies will develop. And Marx says, I beg your pardon, you do me too much credit and too much discredit. I don't know enough to make such comments. <laughs> and he spends the last years of his life trying to understand what we now call the global south. And he dies before he writes much of it up because he didn't know enough to, be com to come to a conclusion. It, it's interesting that you're making this point because just last weekend we had um, uh, Steve Paxton on who wrote a book called Unlearning Marx. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, his I work. I read it. No. Uh -huh. um, but he, his book kind of takes the, the stance that um, the Stalin project was doomed to fail if you are a follower of Marx. Absolutely. And kind of, it kind of set up the Soviet Union for what ended up happening with its fall with capitalists, setting it up to be capitalist more than it did having communism in, in one country. And I actually, me personally, I don't think that that's a good ideology, communism in one country, <laughs> especially when the dominating power is a capitalist power, going to run into some issues. Well, um, see a lot James, who was, of course, an important American, uh, Trinidadian, American, British Marxist, cause, and African, because he was everywhere. <laughs> but see a lot James actually wrote an essay in 1940 or 41, I think it is, entitled, Soviet Russia is a Fascist State. Uh, he would even, mm -hmm. he was with Dunievskaya, my mentor, was the, the person who developed the, the Marxist theory of state capitalism uh, in the Marxist movement in the early 1940s, mid 1940s of Johnson Forest tendency. But he even went further than state capitalism. I'm not sure he continued with that line of argument. Uh, but he actually went so far as to say this has nothing to do with Marxism, right? I mean, slave labor camps and central, centralizing the economy in the hands of a small committee of individuals, et cetera, et cetera. And I, you know, I think that there's a lot of evidence that Soviet communism, and I argue Chinese communism too, because Mao's model was based very much with some small changes on the Soviet model. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a bigger gift to capitalism than could have dreamed. Because, mm -hmm. uh, of course, mm -hmm. they want to, any capitalist wants to say, we all, of course, they're not going to make a distinction of an anarchist, a Marxist humanist, uh, a feminist, uh, or a revolutionary feminist, a communist, a Stalinist, or whoever. Mm -hmm. If you're going to take away their property, which I think their property should be taken away <laughs> if they <laughs> accumulate too much of it. <laughs> uh, if you're going to take away your, your, your property on any basis, even if it's Bernie Sanders trying to take it away, you're a communist. Or even if it's Barack Obama, which is ridiculous, you're a socialist. <laughs> so uh, they're going to attack us all on the, same, on the same level. But the fact of the matter is they, they were able to say, well, look where it, they took away our property in the Soviet Union and here and everywhere else. And look why, how they ended up. Well, it becomes a strong propaganda tool to convince people well, not to go outside the boundaries of actually existing capitalism and to work within it, including when it comes to challenging its racialized structures. So this is a big, big problem. Why we need uh, to uh, start a new leaf and say, no, that 
that post-Marx Marxism is not the same as Marx, not to say that Marx has all the answers or that he was right in everything, or that we have to genuflect before his, his, uh, his legacy, because that doesn't get us anywhere. But there are conceptions within the works of individuals like Marx, like Rosa Luxemburg, who, of mm-hmm. course, they do a lot of work in, and Fanon. And I think there's a lot of similarities between Luxemburg and Fanon, as well as big differences. Um, and many other thinkers that we can talk about. Cabral, for instance, which is one of mm-hmm. my favorite uh, thinkers. What do, uh, wait, how do you feel about Walter Rodney? Mixed. Uh, I, I, I actually uh, briefly met him when I was very, very young. So I kind of adore that experience <laughs> and was certainly a brave and, and, and a dedicated yeah. revolutionary. Mm. Uh, and a lot of the work that he was doing was really outstanding. Uh, but he operated within the standard Marxist Leninist model. Right. Uh, there's actually a uh, Robin Kelly has an essay on Walter Rodney and Rosa Luxemburg in this book that just came out, uh, which I also have a chapter in Creolizing Rosa Luxemburg, uh, which uh, uh, Paget Henry also has a chapter in it, who's an important Caribbean uh, theoretician, uh, and um, uh, draws out some of the contradictory problems in, in Rodney's own uh, um, uh, uh, criticism, for instance, of Maurice Bishop in the New Jewel Movement in Grenada, where I think that he was um, he was really more starting with the more hardline Marxist-Leninist elements of Austin and Cord uh, mm-hmm. rather than Bishop himself, and I think that was highly problematic. Um, I don't know if I agree with all of Robin's uh, criticisms of Rodney for um, uh, he kind of echoes C.L.R. James's position that his the conditions of his murder were un- inadvertently in part brought on by his own uh, poli- uh, political positions that he was taking in Guyana. That's an issue I, I haven't made up my mind about. But he's there are problems with he, he who was part of that generation which didn't question much of the prevailing assumptions of 20th century Marxism, and I think that held him back. Well, well keeping, oh, I'm sorry, Pascal, do you have a question? I'm sorry. Uh, no, I mean, I, I am actually a, an admirer of Walsh Rodney, and uh, I, I, there are some of the points here. I mean, I see your overall point in terms of the problematic nature of what the Soviet project overall, but I still think that in the realpolitik of what they were dealing with as a nation, it was still a revolutionary project that had its faults and basically did aid in much of the anti-colonial, anti-imperialist struggle that happened in the global South, particularly with the Cuban Revolution, as well as with the actions that were done in 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 Africa as well, which of course were at the marks, and I would agree with that. But uh, you know, I am uh, I think that criticism of the Soviet project is fair, and I think it's it's just justified. But to I think it's very easy in the eleventh hour to do real view mirroring and say, well, that, well, it would have been better off if we didn't have that. Because I would say that, you know, the world post-Soviet in terms of what has happened in a unilateral kind of American empire, going from the war on terror mm-hmm. to a, quite a variety of things without having the Soviet Union being able to check that power. I wonder, you know, how much those who, you know, f- feel good that the Soviet Union is gone feel about those developments as well, particularly with the rise of, you know, as you were saying, neo-fascism that we have in the wake of this kind of unipol- Western unipolarity also. So, uh, you know, I think that we would have our disagreements in terms of that particular analysis of the utility of, uh, you know, the, the rise of the Soviet Union as well as uh, Mao and, and Chinese communism, which, again, this is something that is a common internal uh, disagreement yes. debate amongst yes. Marxists, leftists of all strains. And I get that. But uh, I'm more interested in actually in staying on Fanon. And yes. what I think I find valuable with Fanon is that he represents the best of all of these traditions in that he has the revolutionary anti-capitalist uh, sentiment of the Marxist-Leninist camp without having the ec- economist determinism of the more vulgarist aspect of Marxism mm-hmm. and at the same time understanding the need for having a sophisticated understanding of the way race within these structures needs to be analyzed and dissected as well. So uh, I think that his ability to fuse all of those traditions at a time in which we're seeing the newly liberated former colonial countries come about uh, demonstrates his brilliance. But I want to ask a question that, uh, as a matter of fact, I was talking to one of our friends of show I was about. Uh, This might seem kind of reductionist, but I like your thoughts. Would you consider 
would you consider Fanon a postmodernist thinker or post-structuralist? Uh, no, um, which is not to say that there are elements of Fanon that have influenced postmodernism and post-structuralist thought to some degree, <laughs> among some of them at least. But um, postmodernism, post-structuralism, beginning with the end of man speech of Derrida in 68, which was delivered in May 68, just about a week after the revolution in Paris failed, curiously, it is a historical moment, uh, right through to, uh, you know, whatever you want to call postmodern or post-structuralism for the decades afterwards, and certainly in Foucault, uh, there is a conscious, deliberate attempt to uh, put humanism into um, the dustbin of history. Um, so there's a wholesale uh, a, a criticism of humanism as being no different than the kind of uh, abstract uh, or even reactionary so-called humanism that characterized the Enlightenment uh, or the Renaissance. Now, th we can talk a lot about why that's problematic, right? First of all, there's many different Enlightenments, right? There's no one thing called the Enlightenment. Uh, Spinoza is not the same as John Locke. De Condorcet, who organized the group the Society of the Friends of the Blacks and fought for the abolition of slavery uh, in France, is not the same uh, as uh, Isaac Newton, who, of course, uh, was a firm defender of slavery, or Thomas Jefferson, or we can talk about a lot of other people. But without getting into those kinds of weeds about, you know, European intellectual history, um, post-structural and post-modernism were uh, utilized, to the extent that Fanon was utilized by such thinkers, they were making him compatible with a certain discourse in academia. So it's kind of like you cut off the humanist dimension of, of Fanon, and you emphasize his, his critique of the failures or the impending failures of the African revolutions. Now, Fanon was prophetic in seeing that the independence, the movements for independence, though a great moment was, was reached with independence, was nevertheless only a cause for a few days of celebration, as it were, because there's so many limitations and contradictions that they now had to deal with, that if they didn't deal with them effectively, there would be a retrogression. Uh, and postmodernism is basically... Uh, a school of thought that's emerging from those who have experienced profound disappointment with, with political transformation, starting in May 68 and continuing afterwards, uh, and who basically uh, didn't believe that fundamental social transformation on any kind of systemic level is any longer possible. Now, Fanon is coming from a very different direction. He believes it is possible. And I think that if you remove the humanist dimension from Fanon or simply lay, leave it to the side, as it's sometimes done, uh, you uh, you you lose the beauty of uh, of what uh, you not only lose uh, the depth of his negative critique that is what's going wrong with the African revolutions, but most importantly, you, you cut out you, you're left without any sense of where to go from there, where to go from the negative. Um, and I also have to say that if you look at the history of post structuralist thought, we go back to Althusser, who was of course Foucault's teacher, right, um, and was from Algeria, right. Well, Derrida though, was too. By the way, Derrida has some good things. I'm not dismissing Derrida as a thinker. I respect Derrida a great deal, and there's some aspects of Derrida that, especially some of his later work, which are quite on point. But the, nevertheless, the point is, is you look at the, um, Althusser, you look at Foucault. I mean, he was part of the French Communist Party from 1950 to 53. Then he left it, but he didn't leave it over its policy on the, on the uh, African revolutions or the colonies. Where did he voice any strong support for the Algerian Revolution or for the African Revolution, for that matter? If he did, I'm not aware of it. And I don't think that's a minor issue. Uh, this is the, 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 the question of the struggle against col uh, colonialism and racism is the issue of the 20th century and the 21st. OK, that is the so. So uh, there's and one of the reasons why I think Fanon didn't kind of declare himself a Marxist or see himself within that context explicitly, is he didn't want to get bogged down to the weeds of the debates within different Marxist tendencies, because that was going to take him away from his mission. His mission was to do something that had not been done before, which was to provide a philosophical account of race and racism, which, as you mentioned, is both systemic, that is, grasping its, its, its roots in the nature of capitalism and what we, the social system we've been living under for 400 years, but also has deep psychological roots that outlive uh, the origins of, of those racial determinations and simply are not automatically brought down by a struggle against capitalism. And he's right about that. It's not automatically brought down by a struggle against capitalism. So he, wanted, he was trying to do something very new, and I think he had to step out of that a bit 
You have to step out of that lot and say, listen, I'm going to work on this angle and on this particular problem that I'm experiencing my lived experience. I noticed that in earlier in the chat, somebody had asked the question, what about phenomenology, which would be an interesting discussion to have. Fanon was very interested from an early age, influenced by, uh, as Lewis Gordon has pointed out in several of his books, in, in phenomenology. He studied under Mer Merleau-Ponty in Lyon, who was one of the foremost French phenomenologists. One of the central points in phenomenology is what? Bracketing. If you cannot come to a definitive answer on something, bracket it out, and then focus on the fundamental issue that you do have evidence for resolving. Fanon was going in that direction. And um, I don't think that uh, that means we bracket out the debates in Marxism today uh, for ourselves, but there's a reason he took the approach that he did. So no, I don't think that he was, he would have been happy with postmodernism or post-structuralism. I think that he would have looked, I mean, if you read Homi Baba's introduction to Black Skin, White Mask, I cannot believe that Fanon would not be furious at that. Mm. So, um, and I, I, I shot fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did have a question as far as like bringing things into the day, as far as what we can learn and 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 take forward. And um, you even mentioned like uh, Luxembourg, and you know, I kind of like been thinking quite a lot of like how how to hear like at least the entire contra contradictions where you could have a movement or you can have a certain action that could be on the step to you know, revolution or, you know, the, the overturning of capitalism. Um, but then also, too, it could just be an action unto itself that is just <laughs> something that, you know, is done. Um, so I wonder if there's any anything with Fanon's critique of negritude um, and then possibly falling into this, uh, in, in you know, falling into the structure of, what, uh, of itself uh, was fighting against. How do, you know, I guess, how can we go moving forward, trying to learn the lessons of Fanon as far as deciding what actions, what movements are revolutionary or, you know, even like going back to the, uh, the yeah, some of the writings of Marx uh, later on of like, this can be revolutionary if, you know, X, Y, and Z then happens. Mm -hmm. Great question. Yeah, I mean, what, what, comes to my mind when you when you speak of this is he has this very interesting passage in the, in the Wretched of the Earth. It might be repeated more than once because, you know, he didn't write that much about the United States, right? So, uh, and he wasn't trying, again, to do a universal po political theory uh, that would apply to all situations. This is not, the phenomenological approach is, is, to, is to focus on elemnis, right? The lived experience of the subject, of the individual, and draw, develop your theory from that zero point of your orientation, that is your particular standpoint upon existence in the world, rather than trying to make these broad claims uh, for which you lack substantial evidence. Um, but he has this very interesting point where I think does relate, uh, and I think he is thinking about the United States, where he says, in the colonial situation, there is no buffer. This, it's a Manichaean world, right? There's no buffer between the colonized and the, and, and the colonizer, right? Uh, it's very naked and brutal and direct, the exploitation. Uh, and every institution of the state operates on behalf of the colonizer, and every uh, uh, life situation of the colonized is impacted uh, by these um, visible and invisible forms of domination uh, that confront the individual on a daily level. But he says in more, in other uh, contexts, he says, doesn't mention the word the United States, but I think he's thinking about it, is there are there are these intermediary layers, right? You have the police and you have the, you have civil society, right? You have these institutions of civil society that can mediate conflicts to some degree uh, between uh, the oppressor class and the oppressed. Um, but what have we been seeing in America in the last 30, 40 years? I mean, oh, further than that, going all the way back to what the Panthers pointed out back in the late 60s, right? Uh, when Huey Newton talked about the deindustrialization of America, and what does that mean for the future of capitalism? He was addressing that in 1969, right? Because uh, after all, who first experienced deindustrialization in the United States was primarily African Americans before the word even existed, okay? Um, and that is that what we're seeing is that the lines of the lines of, of oppression and the depressive structures have become much clearer. And it's, it's, it, we're, we're moving in a much more Manichaean direction here in this so-called bourgeois democracy, which always tries to pretend that uh, there's buffers between uh, these different classes. And so I think 
my reading of Fanon would suggest that the kind of political activity uh, that is most effective of those that actually challenge uh, this increased uh, kind of forms of domination, like the police, and the fact that we had the biggest protest in American history in 2020, of course, against police abuse, 26 million people, there was never that many people for that long period of time out in the streets of the United States in continuous protests that I'm aware of, uh, tells us something about where to go. And it also shows us the challenges that were brought up by several of you in your questions and comments from earlier. Because when I'm part of the Chicago campaign to defund police, and we've been you know, doing a lot of work for the last year on this, um, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a hard slog, right? Because there you run into what uh, you had called the, the, national, the, the national petty bourgeoisie, the national democratic petty bourgeoisie within the black community, uh, which does not want to go along with defunding which exposes a lot of the rips within uh, the movement over these issues. And we're all within, not movement, but within uh, certainly those who claim to be uh, concerned or opposed to the problem uh, to racism. And I, I think that those are some really, really important struggles because to uh, call for the abolition of the criminal justice system, to call for the abolition of pr police and prisons, this is, you cannot have racialized capitalism with these, with these institutions in existence. Without it, not being in existence, racialized capitalism cannot ex cannot p perpetrate itself without them. I, I wanted to ask you about the concept of racialized capitalism or racial mm -hmm. capitalism, uh, which is a term that we we actually hear here and there, uh, mostly from the, and, and I'm not saying this as a pejorative, as from the academics that come on the show, right. they, they they say the term racial capitalism. But I'm noticing that this term is actually starting to infiltrate the lexicon of kind of everyday speak that you do here uh, on the left, especially the online left. Um, and Pascal, please feel free to add on to this because I know you have your opinion on racial capitalism as you got into a conversation, <laughs> a, a mildly heated conversation over the, the concept of racial capitalism with the guest mm -hmm. when, we, when we first started together. Do you remember that? Uh, there's been so many, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, part of a mass movement. <laughs> uh, well, you know, uh, when I hear the term racial capitalism or racialized capitalism, ultimately, isn't it just capitalism? And when you say racialized capitalism, what does it do to the fight? against capitalism when we start now making it racialized are we going to genderize it next um is it already i like i mean is that already there to it you know an extent you, you, pa pascal can can say this much better than, than I, can. I have a very simple position on the concept of racialized capitalism and why i find it problematic i think that one of the actual assumptions when you say racialized capitalism is that the only reason you don't like capitalism is because it doesn't work for black people and if it did we had no problem with it mm -hmm. That's a possible. Yeah, that that is a problem. I agree. Uh, it's uh, it's a useful term if it's used in a useful way <laughs> or in a helpful way. But like a lot of terms um, we can talk about in politics, uh, it's subject. It's a very slippery term that's subject to all kinds of interpretation. The term actually came out of the South African liberation struggle. I believe it was first coined by Neville Alexander, right? Um, who was a, a Trotskyist uh, revolutionary in South Africa who had to deal with the specificity of the situation there, in which capital accumulation and racism were inextricably connected, right? So the bait within the South Africa movement was, uh, do we, is, is this a fight, is, is the fight against apartheid uh, and the fight against racial discrimination going to quasi-automatically challenge the structures of capitalism uh, or are they separable, right? And that's the debate that he was in between the ANC and the Black Consciousness Movement, right, o over that very question. Um, Cedric Robinson, of course, is more famous for, for the use of that phrase. Uh, and But when you reread that book, you realize it's slippery in his own use of it as well. Because on the one hand, he wants to say that capitalism, at least in certain historical contexts, has been from its inception thoroughly racist, which he's certainly right about. Um, class relations in American history have always been mediated by racial determinations. And if you don't face up to that uh, and you call for, oh, just because uh, if you don't, if, if you're not overburdened by that by that fact, you pass over the fact that struggles against racism 
that independent struggles of black masses against racial discrimination have time and time again proved the catalyst for the class struggle and the vanguard of promoting class struggle rather than a diversion from it, right? Um, but the other side of Cedric Robinson is that then when he goes to explain what he means by this, he starts talking about the origins of racialized capitalism and feudalism, that presumably anti-black racism can be found in the attitude of, I guess, the English colonizing the Irish in the 12th century, et cetera, yeah. or the Vikings attacking the French, et cetera, which uh, I don't think he supplies any historical, um, a, a coherent historical analysis of that. Um, but furthermore, it raises the question, look, if it's not the transit, if, if, if you're going to say that racially, race is socially constructed, the question that comes to mind immediately is what specific social relations are responsible for this construction of racism? Now, I think there's a good Marxist answer to that. Uh, you don't have to be a Marxist to agree with it, but I think it comes from Marxism, and that is the transatlantic slave trade, the birth of the world market, and the is the rosy dawn of capitalist accumulation based on the labor of black skins, right? That is what made the Industrial Revolution possible and what made modern capitalism possible and still makes it possible. But if you're going to push it back and say, no, 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 this was this this exists in white societies even going way back before capital, the, the transatlantic slave trade, then you're obligated to say, what are the specific social relations that give rise to whiteness and anti-black uh, anti ways of seeing? If you can't answer that question, Robinson doesn't, then you're falling back, as far as I can tell, into a biological view of race, as if it's something that just naturally occurs. And you're leaving capitalism, not only capitalism off the hook, you're, 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 you're missing Fanon's paradigmic shift uh, about race as a social construction. So uh, the reason why I think where, where racial capitalism comes in importance, when I hear the word racial capitalism, what I think of, I think of the specificity, especially of you know, American de historical development where race class relations are thoroughly saturated and mediated by considerations of race from the very beginning. So you can't undo the class structure of capitalist modernity without having uh, racism uh, and the battle against racism take the priority. Right. Like, wouldn't, wouldn't those who would consider themselves Marxists, and I have not met one who would deny this, is that the way in which capitalism functions in America, it requires that black people disproportionately be relegated to the reserve army of labor. We had Richard Wolf on a show and he basically admitted that, you know, that's absolute, not only did he admit that, he went even further than, mm -hmm. than, than, than that axiom basically saying that black people are the shock absorbers mm -hmm. of capitalism in the United States. But, so but we, I, we can also say that about uh, immigrants. Yes. As, as we did mention the role of immigrants yeah. that as well. So f the, 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 the 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 issue I have with the term racial capitalism is that you know it seems kind of like you know oxymoron. It's self evident to the fact that the nature of the way in which capitalism works is is that it particularly has a racial hierarchy to it. Going back to the way in which the prim in the ages of primitive accumulation, going back to you know the genocide of the Native Americans taking of their land, the transatlantic slave trade. So I it makes me ask the question, you know. If we know this and we realize that this is what capitalism requires to function, turning racial capitalism into the term of art, again, understanding how this basically works in this contemporary era in which race is being served to meet a bourgeois liberal notion of democ democratizing equ equality of opportunity, distribution, and recognition, under a neoliberal frame that does not actually change allocation of wealth or resources, mm -hmm. that saying racial capitalism basically is a means of saying capitalism don't work for black folk in a time where capitalism is working less and less for almost everyone. Right. But it, uh, so I, I certainly agree with everything that you said, but the qualifier here is that there's also dimensions of racism that cannot be reduced directly uh, to the laws of capitalist economics. So if you think about, for instance, the prison industrial complex, um, and of course you can make a good, very good argument, and I would agree with it to a large degree, that this is driven by purely economic motives. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the question is, why is there such a high disproportion uh, be, uh, of those who are negatively affected by this prison industrial complex who are African-Americans? Well, I think that goes to an extra economic factor uh, this 
criminal justice system that we have, the prison industrial complex, emerges in response to 1968, emerges in response to the Black Power Movement, to the Civil Rights Movement, and the radicalization of a whole generation of Black youth. And the bourgeois society decided that this is a way to get these kids off the street, is to put them in the prison, right? And this is continuous since then. Now, is that direct? Does that have no economic motives or consequences? I'm sure that it does in some respects, but in some of the other respects, it doesn't. When it costs sixty thousand dollars a year to keep somebody in a in a in a state penitentiary, which is more money now, or maybe it's a little less than what it takes to get uh, pay somebody tuition at Harvard University or something, um, it doesn't look like it makes a lot of sense from the strict economic imperatives of the system. I actually want to respond to that because I'm glad you mentioned that because I actually brought up a piece that actually addresses this specifically. It's called The Economic Origins of Mass Incarceration. And it actually deals with the perception of the argument that the only thing that motivated mass incarceration was the rebellions of the 60s without taking into the context that as with every period of rebellion, there was a high increase of crime, particularly violent crime. And what actually is done in this piece the, the economic origins of mass incarceration, which you can find in Catalyst, is it demonstrates that particularly the, the way in which mass incarceration is transpired in the United States, which is also something you can read in Loic Wakan's books, Punishing the Poor, is that mm -hmm. the motivation for mass incarceration by far is more driven by political economy than by race because of the fact that at this period of economic of increase in crime you also have massive deindustrialization again as well so what becomes the racial reality of mass incarceration is again as a result of the fact that black people disproportionately because of the way they are used in american political economy are the reserve army of labor and they suffer more adversely from the social effects causing an increase in proliferation of crime and poverty. And mm -hmm. at the same time, and one of the great pieces of evidence that the article demonstrates is that the actual racial disparity in the rate of mass incarceration from the 40s up until the 21st century stays f relatively flat, while the actual rate of mass incarceration for people who are college educated or above and high school dropouts expands precipitously. So the mm -hmm. argument he's making is that if race is the motivation between for mass incarceration, why is it that college educated blacks drop precipitously as the rate of those who are incarcerated when blacks who are high school dropouts are going up? So what okay. he's saying is that what we actually seeing is that the problem is that poverty which disproportionately affects black people is what is actually driving this than simply blackness. Well, can't can we also add that as black people are starting to get certain advances with the civil rights movement at the same time, we're starting to see factories leave. So mm -hmm. as we're finally getting into unions, these, these jobs are leaving. And, and also I, I would want to add as someone that has traveled extensively through the middle of the country, um, as a Bay Area native, it is very shocking for me in my travels to see um, how the Rust Belt areas, which are a lot wider outside of places like Cleveland and where Marcus knows Columbus, <laughs> like the, the small chocolate parts of, of Ohio, stuff like that, but predominantly uh, white areas that are, that are suffering the same effects. And if we say the shock absorbers of capitalism, you know, you can always add those people who uh, are disproportionately affected by the, the factory closings that are still happening now. I have to remember, uh, uh, was it two years ago or a year ago, uh, 40, was it four, four or 5,000 people had lost work recently when a bunch of factories closed after they were mm -hmm. supposed to uh, st stay open. Um, and, and if you look at, prison populations um there is a growing uh white population especially with the um growing opioid addiction which is causing people to go back to heroin um you know i've spent probably too much time in west virginia <laughs> and and in the appalachians in general and that's what blew me away about it because it was a hillbilly version, if you will, of what I grew up with in, in uh, Richmond, California, um, which is why I could navigate those areas, I guess, so well, because it's the, it's all the same thing. It's just a different color on it. Um, 
But you know, if you're if you're in Chicago, much like me being in Oakland, California, Pascal being from New York, and Marcus now, you know, in DC, we definitely see the racialized view of mass incarceration because this is also where a bunch of us live. Mm-hmm. Highly concentrated in these major metropolitan areas. Because for years, you know, for me, that's why my family settled in California. That's where the work was during during the uh, the New Deal. Mm-hmm. More well, you know, I, I spent I spent a little bit of time, not uh, not a ton of it, so I'm not claiming to have any t- uh, particularly important insights here. But um, Holland County, Kentucky, Eastern Kentucky, which is very I close to West exactly, Virginia, which I is know exactly uh, where you're talking. You know, about. You know what goes on there? Johnson Florida City, Baptist. Tennessee. I love yeah. yeah. I was staying a little hamlet called Hell for Certain, and I realized after a day or two why they called it that. <laughs> okay, so, um, and you know, this is going back about 15 years ago, and like, mm-hmm. there was a, a long history of not just labor struggle, but I mean, mm-hmm. people forget about the proportion of black miners in, in, that, mm-hmm. in, in those areas in Appalachia, right? Mm-hmm. And the solidarity between white and black labor, you know, in those, in those struggles, which often took a very violent form. Um, Robert Olbitz has a book out, by the way, that discusses this in terms of further back history, when workers uh, shot back, I think it's called. But anyway, the point is, is that um, you had a lot of you had a lot of native uh, indigenous American radicalism in them hills. OK, mm-hmm. uh, and I was there with a friend who was black uh, and we were giving a talk to a group of we were having discussions on radical ideas. We got a great reception. Uh, I remember he was <laughs> one, one, one of the one of the folks from the hills, I'm not going to use the word hillbilly, uh, said to uh, <laughs> uh, said to him as he's leaving, he said, oh, you got to come back here more often. We got to have you back more often. I mean, boy, boy, this is great. The kind of stuff you got, you, you've been talking about. What's talking about me? He was talking about my friend. Anyway, the point is now, right? I mean, it is like whew, Trump territory. How did that happen? And that's the thing that we have to think about, right? How does that happen? It's not, it's not a question simply of, of, of who is being affected in what, in what respect by this, um, you know, by the, the deindustrialization that we document and talk about, but why the response? Why is it that you have white workers who are subject to deindustrialization and com- rightly complaining about it, uh, then using that as a basis? And it's certainly not saying that's true of all white workers, because th- there's a myth that most white workers support Trump, but a, a larger percentage than ever we've seen that voting Republican. So that's a serious problem. Why are they buying into the racist agenda? And they have to know it's a racist agenda. When African Americans were subjected to those the conditions of deindustrialization and and did, certainly did not move in a right wing direction like that. So what's the same reason working that? class black people are increasing their support of Trump? Because they are. Mm-hmm. No, it, Trump. First of all, let's just be honest. Let's be honest for a second. Mm-hmm. This is just my opinion, uh, uh, Doctor Hudis. Why? because of those shock absorbers and the shock absorbers now look a little different. We're talking about immigrants, especially through the eighties when we have a a huge flow from South and and, and Central America, especially Central America because of the, the, the dirty wars. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you look at places like the South and just look at meatpacking, and I don't know if you guys remember about a year or so ago, there was a raid on a meatpacking plant from immigration, from ICE. Mm-hmm. And this, these meatpacking plants historically were black. black. Black people worked there. They actually were union jobs. Mm-hmm. Let's remember in 86, Reagan signs that bill that gives 3 million, I, don't, I wouldn't say it's all Mexican Americans, but you know, 3 million Latin Americans citizenship. That wasn't, a a gesture of goodwill that was a a way to try to start to fuck with the labor market Mm -hmm. that was his whole goal that was part of that huge project Mm -hmm. and when you looked at the people that were being deported they weren't making more than the black people were some 20 years prior and I think that's where Trumpism comes in because the rhetoric around immigration 
is never rhetoric around labor struggles. It's always about the benevolence of America being this wonderful place, giving opportunity to the downtrodden of some backwards land. And it's never about labor struggles. So it's easy for the Donald Trumps of the world to come in, the Steve Bannons of the world to come in and really frighten people. And even the ADOS movement, for the most part, echoes the same rhetoric of white nationalism. Africans will not replace us. Mm-hmm. Right. That's mm-hmm. this is just my opinion. Mm-hmm. Well, some, uh, going on the specific like is as, as far as like the white people in the South, something that I find interesting. And in, um, as you're talking about over time, it just even seems like their cultural aspects, especially in relation to the state, was like completely gone. You know, and, like I think of like NASCAR or something that like no longer makes sense to me you know as an origin of something that's like literally running from the cops doing illegal (laughs) activity but then you know like if you look at a nascar event today and you'll see probably more blue lives matter flags you know (laughs) than than anything else where Mm -hmm. yeah that's that's something where it's like is does does racism i guess you know it does does those, those cultural pulls you know end up really being such a force that you kind of erase even recent history you know like mm-hmm. just even though the advent of of the mo- like automobile um and especially the to, to the point where people can now you know, like construct their own versions to run from the police to be a type of resistance of the state and then what within a generation you know you've got a completely kind of like overturn of that whole aspect um you know I don't know. It's just something. I mean, if we already if we already acknowledge, and I think we all agree here about the reserve army of labor capacity mm-hmm. of blacks and immigrants serving that sh- shock absorber role, I don't think it becomes a mystery as to the capacity of the ruling class to weaponize white anxiety about displacement or or lack of preference in terms of policy consideration into a type of voting pattern. That becomes reactionary. This was done by Nixon, starting with the you know the hard hat riots, yeah. hard hat rebellions in the seventies. You know what was the Reagan Democrat? The Reagan Democrat was basically, you know, uh, a, a a white working class person who was a loyal Democrat, voted before sixty eight, and because of the belief that you know the Negroes have gotten too much, started to basically move to the Republican Party. So the compa- none of this denies the fact that within the working class white or otherwise, there is a clear potential for racist reactionary politics to be tapped into, to be weaponized, to become a basis of support. There's no question about that. That also does not deny that there is a materials level to what motivates that racial angst. And what motivates that racial angst is that you given those brown folk what I thought I was supposed to get, because yes, there is a racialized component to capitalism. There's no question about that whatsoever. I don't necessarily think that those things are divergent in terms of their reality at all. They're just easily manipulated in the consciousness in a society that has always rendered blackness or foreignness or Latinoness into the dustbin of economic functionality, giving those people the belief that they have the natural born right to believe that they should get theirs first. That is the nature of American capitalism, which is clearly racialized. I just think it's kind of redundant to admit the obvious. But I ask also that when you say that, you're basically saying to people who are not white, who are not black, who are suffering from capitalism, or who may be other ethnic groups that, well, the problem is racial capitalism. Like, oh, okay, that means that capitalism doesn't work for black people. We don't have to worry about that then. You know, right. if you say the problem is racial capitalism, then how do you get people who are not racialized to challenge capitalism? Well, uh, but we also have the problem, right? Of there's a tradition in the American left, uh, which has not gone away by any means, of uh, wanting to challenge capitalism and treat racial issues as a secondary consideration. Well, I, I'm not making that. I, I think it's. I know that, I know you're not making argument. that argument. I'm just saying that's that's one possible virtue of the phrase racialized capitalism. It's a pushback against that. But you're right. Like any phrase, it's full of ambiguity, which is why I'm trying to suggest even the author, the, the person most famous for the phrase, Cedric Robinson, 
his work is full of ambiguities in this. And uh, actually, it leads him out of Marxism, right? I mean, he, could, he the second edition of Black Marxism, he says, I'm with Foucault, I'm no longer with Marx. The, the main reason why I, I posit the position that I, I, I have is that as someone who is a student of how Black politics in the contemporary moment works, and understanding that we have what you refer to as this kind of petite bourgeoisie, or what we refer to as the Black political class, that basically functions in a kind of similar way to the comprador or neo-colonial bourgeoisie, if you will, that they're basically, they have rendered black politics to be to the service of the liberal bourgeoisie capitalist ruling class to the detriment of the majority of the masses of black people. One of the consequences of that that political reality, which is largely a post-civil rights 50 year plus counter-revolution phenomenon, which is a framing that we use on this show to talk about the 50 years of politics since the assassination of King, is that there is an intentional attempt to use race and racism purely in one of one of the ways that Fanon talks about it as an interpersonal problem because it's easier for black elites to use the interpersonal narrative because what it does it makes it easier to demand policy that benefits them because it makes no material demands on the structures of capital uh, as a result, the, the posture of what becomes black politics in this contemporary moment mm -hmm. is an attempt to double down on the racialization of harm, not because they actually want to address the concerns and needs of the majority of black people, but to serve the interests of capital by deflecting black people away from demanding materialist politics and policies that would disproportionately benefit the majority of poor and working class black people who are rendered to the reserve army of labor, like a federal jobs guarantee, like a universal employment basis, which some of these race reductionists will say class politics, class based policy don't work for black people. Really? Does your, your grandmother doesn't like his social security and Medicare? Your, your uncle doesn't like his VA benefit? You want to get rid of those for him too? I like my VA benefit. But going on the other <laughs> side, uh, so what is the reason what why is... I, I'm, I'm particularly uh, I'm particularly animated in addressing the the contemporary high sh hyper racialization of capitalism in a way divorced from political economy is because it's a transparent ploy of the of the political mm -hmm. chattering class, the black political elites right now to keep black people tied into these non-materialist policies that end up benefiting that black elite and doing nothing for the majority of black people. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, going on the other side of that, just in the super chat, what does the working class material gain from Trump is uh, Trumpism or Brexit, um, which both advocate for less labor protections um, slash benefits, et cetera, et cetera? Well, that's the point. They don't gain materially at all. Uh, and that, it's not an accident that the parts of the country where uh, whites obtain some of the highest uh, percentage of social benefits are precisely the areas where they're voting most strongly for Trump. So um, that's a good question, though, which I'm not sure I have the answer to. Is it what Du Bois, how Du Bois tried to answer the question? And they wrote right, the wages of wages of whiteness. Right, psychological wage instead of, a, a, instead of an economic wage. I'm not convinced by that argument, frankly, uh, but I'm open to it, but I'm not convinced by it. I mean, we're getting into something that racism is so fundamentally irrational it becomes uh, very difficult at a certain point to explain the motivations. I'll just give you, I mean, one example, uh, an anecdote is somebody who I know is doing research at a Chicago area university for his PhD on the radical right. So he embeds himself in radical right organizations. This is before Trump. This is his research starts before Trump, back to the Tea Party. And uh, he is uh, in Colorado and they say, well, this is guy who was very active in uh, in the Tea Party movement in Colorado, who used to be a uranium miner, now he's at home because he's on a breathing device because he has all kinds of lung problems, emphysema or whatever else from his work environment. And he interviews him and uh, explain, tries to get him to explain to him why is he um, such a Tea Party proponent? Why does he hate Obama so much and everything else? And asks him um, and says to him, well, but you do realize that like you're so against Obamacare and you said that's what set you off? Uh, Look at you, you're, you're, you're breathing through this tube, right? I mean, and you can't afford your own medical insurance. You admitted that to me at the beginning of this interview. Um, you would benefit by these uh, scenarios, right? These policies. Why don't you come out for them? 
Why you oppose them? And he pulls the mask off of his face, right? He can barely breathe. And he stunts out and he just blurts out with whatever little breath and energy he has. I'd rather have, I'd rather die here on the spot than have one nickel of my money go to these blacks and immigrants. Um, how do you explain that one? Is a good question. Is that a psychological wage that he's gaining? He's certainly not gaining an economic wage. Or is it something that is like what Du Bois himself experienced when he witnessed, you know, a lynching, the aftermath of a lynching uh, in the South when he went back down South um, and talks about that in some of his correspondence and said, where he questions his own theory of the psychological wage because of that? Or is there something deeper involved? I mean, for known by taking, the, there is always a danger of approaching a, psycho, a psychoanalytical approach to the problems of racism that, of course, disassociates itself from political economy and disassociates it from radical from politics in general. That's always a risk, just like it's a risk that politics and political economy will disassociate itself from examining and dealing with the psychic, psychic impact of racial discrimination. That's why from the very first line of Black Skin, White Man, first pages, I think it's first page, page two, Fanon makes that point that the two have to be dealt with in tandem, right? That's, I mean, in a nutshell, that to me is what makes Fanon uh, an outstanding figure. He is able to deal with the both sides of this issue as one in tandem with each other. But it's very hard to keep these things together. So you have the identity politics that disassociates them from one side. You have class reductionism that disassociates them from another side. And it's very easy to get pulled in one or another direction. Uh, and that's why I would have to say that just to pull out some phrases from black skin like masks, for instance, some people like in post-colonial studies do this all the time uh, that I've had to deal with, uh, and downgrade or disregard the wretched of the earth, which is Fanon's manifesto for actual revolution, okay, uh, is a very damaging type of thing. Um, you you got to take, uh, if a thinker has something valid to say, you've got to ask, do, is there an internal coherence to their thought? And if I don't grasp and convey that internal coherence, what damage am I doing to that thinker? And I think Fanon has this remarkable internal coherence to all of what he was doing that is precious to understand, hold on to, and replicate ourselves, uh, because that's a way to navigate ourselves past these kind of false dualities that a lot of you are very correctly pointing to. Well, if we, we, we're, we're, we're coming close to the end of our show, but we didn't ask a question we wanted you to, to, to go into. I don't know if you can cover it in the time before our, our, our two o'clock hour. Uh, the way in which Fanon has been used to... Uh, rationalize Afro-pessimism. What are your thoughts on that? What are your thoughts on that that school of thought overall? Uh, do you think it's a misreading of Fanon? Can you give us a brief uh, statement on your thoughts regarding that? Yeah, I just want to do a shout out here to Toussaint because I mean, a number of years ago, he asked me this question, <laughs> which uh, impelled me to look at Afro-pessimism a bit more closely. Um, and um, uh, he's with us here today, I see. Uh, but the point is, um, well, there's a lot that could be said. Um, I think that the notion of exceptionalism, that an exceptional condition, uh, and to try to explain the predicament of your people as being an exceptional predicament is in itself problematic and doesn't get us anywhere in a struggle for liberation. Um, look, there's a, the talk about the social death that is associated with racial discrimination has its points. But of course, it overlooks an awful lot of things, right? It overlooks uh, after pessimistic argument, wants to basically argue that no, blacks were not brought here for their labor, uh, not for their economic potential. It has nothing to do with political economy. It simply has to do basically with this ontologically ingrained racism that characterizes um, uh, modernity, uh, if not more than that. Um, that you can argue on factual grounds just doesn't make a lot, of, I don't think makes a lot of sense. But you know, I'm from a Jewish background, okay? And I'm not, I, I fought all my life against those who have tried to privilege the Holocaust as the exceptional event in human history. It, it, a, a, an event that happened in my grandparents' lifetime, half of my grandparents' family were wiped off, wiped out in the Holocaust. Any that didn't get out of Kolomaya in Western Ukraine by, 19, by 1939 were not gonna get out, okay? Um, they're in the, they don't even have a grave to mark where they, where they fell. Um, so the, the notion that um, the racism meted out against uh, against black blacks in general and black Americans in particular represents an exceptional case that cannot be related or reduced or connected 
to the genocide against Native Americans or to Jews or to others around the world, which is a premise, basically, the Afrocentric approach. It's just that I, I, just, I just think replicates some of the worst kind of particularism that you get with various forms of alternative nationalisms, including Zionism, frankly. Um, so uh, I think that motivated, I mean, I, I'll be generous enough to say that the Afrocentric position is motivated by an, an acknowledging an objective problem, right? I mean, it arose out of, of Wilderson's stay in South Africa, right? He, he sees this promise of an anti-racist struggle that is supposedly going to deliver liberation, but an ANC, African National Congress, which essentially, in arguing for this multiracial coalition, uh, does what? Well, it uses that multiracialism as a vehicle upon the end of apartheid to do what? To benefit the white uh, existing minority class by giving them, allowing them to maintain economic power in exchange for surrendering some political power. So the disillusionment, this was a major disillusion. This was the most outstanding black revolutionary struggle anywhere in the world that was demobilized in a matter of weeks by the ANC. Okay. Um, I mean, friends of mine, the PAC at the time said, Peter, we saw this coming happening 20 years ago. Why be surprised? Uh, maybe they were right to be, to, 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 to have seen it coming. But the point is, is that it was a real blow to a lot of people uh, in the in the international left uh, to see the demobilization of the South African movement. So I think South Af Afro-pessimism picks up from that moment of disappointment. Not all that dissimilar to how postmodernism and post-structuralism picks up from the disappointment of the moment of the failures of the movements of 68 to then weave a whole narrative out of that disappointment. I think that to go forward as a revolutionary, you have to build from the high points of freedom struggle that have been achieved, not from the low points of freedom struggle that have been aborted. Uh, this was also the mistake, I think, that was made by the Frankfurt School uh, in Germany. Uh, you, you, you have to build from the high points of struggle and resistance that precede us in the past, and then to ask, where do we go from here on the basis of that? To proceed on the basis of defeats and to theorize a the and to develop a theory of defeat, it may be self-assuring. It may explain certain things that you can't explain otherwise. But in the final analysis, look, I'm not interested in Fanon for academic reasons. I'm interested in Fanon because I want to change the world. And I assume that those of you who are listening to this broadcast feel likewise, right? So what kind of perspective, what kind of philosophy is going to change the world? I think it's got to be a Marxist-based philosophy, but not a vulgar Marxist one. So we have to rethink what Marxism means for today based on what that would mean. And Fanon helps us do that immensely, um, uh, precisely maybe because he was looking as, a, as an outsider to that tradition and was trying to do something somewhat independent of it. And he brings a contribution that much Marxists have uh, a lot to learn from. And most people on the left, of course, in general, have a lot to learn from. So, I mean, I'll just leave it there. There's a lot more you can say in the particulars of the Afro-pessimistic uh, de pessimism debate. But I think that um, it's, again, it's another version of shearing off the humanism of Fanon and taking some of his uh, critical insights uh, to heart. Uh, but I don't think Fanon uh, was happy with that. I mean, would have been happy with that. And how, what we know is, look, I mean, he, he adored Sartre. He, um, you know, was thrilled when Sartre agreed to write the preface to The Wretch of the Earth. But from what we know in his last days of life, when he was shown the preface, he couldn't move at that point or even speak, I don't believe. Mm -hmm. But from what his wife communicated, uh, he was not happy when he read that preface because what Sartre made him into was an apostle of violence. Uh, and this was not what Fanon's message was, although he did support violence. His point was a new humanism, and that kind of drops out of Sartre's premise, preface. So let's not repeat the same mistakes again. Excellent. Uh, well, uh, Professor Hooters, I really appreciate you coming on and discussing the, the real deep nuances of uh, Fanon's work and having a contemporary discussion of uh, race capitalism, politics, and revolutionary thought with us. I hope you'd be willing to come back again to talk about either some of your other writings or more in detail if we had a panel addressing this more comprehensively, these types of subject matters. We would love to have you on, and hopefully you'd be willing to do so. I'll be more than glad to do so. This is a great questions and great discussion that we've had. And 
I, I look forward to participating as in the audience as well as any other way that you would like in your future meetings. Well, I, I wanted to know if you'd be willing to come back. Um, there's another uh, professor. I don't know if you you know of his work, uh, Dylan Rodriguez. Uh, he, I think his most recent book is called White Reconstruction. Uh, he's a professor out of uh, UC Riverside. Oh, yes, yes. Okay. Um, also an abolitionist. Um, would love to have you guys come on and we can have a another more roundtable discussion about mm -hmm. uh, the abolitionist framework. Because um, I think it's one of those things that gets in the weeds a little bit because I think the wrong people are, are the ones that are having the conversation sometimes. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> about I agree. It. I can uh, tell you about that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you, uh, from from what we're, we're what I've read already from you uh, and then from what we know about Dylan has been a, a guest on the show several times. I think it would be a, a great uh, conversation and we could take some some real interesting uh, deep dives into abolitionist uh, thought, which is something that I definitely have uh, picked up working with the unhoused. So I would love to do that if you're down. And also another thing I would really like to talk about is uh, Marxist humanism, um, which uh, is a concept that we don't hear about too often. As and then, and to we'd have it. to do another one on your on your activism since you know you mentioned that's <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what that, you consider that's activist. the main let's, that's the main deal <laughs> let's let's do one on that as well so thank okay. you very much uh peter you want to say good night phoenix you wanna okay. say goodbye? yeah that's a, a future yeah, uh you get a future student running around yeah, this, is, uh, this is your future student right here oh phoenix hello phoenix i'm peter you're hi, cute peter. I feel like <laughs> <laughs> got that right on the first thing. <laughs> Where are we going today? We're going today to fishes of the day. We're gonna see some fishes today, and what else? We're gonna see the crocodile today. You're making up crocodiles. We're going. We're going to the aquarium. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Enjoy so, the crocodiles. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Peter, very much, and uh, thank you, Pascal Robert. Thank you, Marcus, of the Left Flank Vets, and enjoy these soothing, hypnotic cartoons. Saturday morning cartoons.